years, it was only a rumor, its name only whispered about. Many questioned its very existence, and even among military pilots, the line between fact and fiction was blurred. But no longer, the stealth fighter is real. unusual, angular, perhaps even sinister looking in its black paint job. But this is no strange mock-up to be used as part of a science fiction movie. Despite the resemblance to something Darth Vader would fly around in, this is the Air Force's newest, and for many years, most secret fighter. The F-117A began as a secret project in the mid-1970s. At that time, it was learned that computer-guided flight controls could overcome inherently unstable conditions in an aircraft's design. At the same time, scientists were figuring out just what an airplane had to look like in order to evade enemy radar beams. This fighter is a coming together of those two technologies. The F-117A is built by the famed Lockheed Skunk Works, that super-secret cadre of designers that gave us the SR-71 Blackbird. And this airplane promises to inspire just about as much lore as its now-retired predecessor. While the F-117A looks exotic, much of what makes it go are off-the-shelf components. It uses the same engine as that powering the F-A-18 Hornet. Its flight control system is similar to the F-16s. The ejection seat is from the F-15. And the inertial navigation system is the same one used in the B-52. All that commonality made it possible to get the fighter built and flying within 31 months of the first go-ahead. Most of the new technology went into the radar-absorbing materials in the angular shape. The airplane also sports such exotic advances as mesh to cover the engine inlets, wide vents for the engine exhausts, and the special canopy that keeps the pilot's helmet from being picked up on radar. But here is where the F-117 will do its work, under the cover of darkness. This is why they call it the Nighthawk.
Even at night, the normal fighter bomber will go in at low levels in order to avoid radar. However, the Nighthawk goes in at up to 25,000 feet and drops to 3,000 feet using its laser designator to mark targets. Because the F-117 does not have to engage in violent jinking maneuvers during the attack, weapons delivery is a smooth, silent, deadly process. For years, residents of southern Nevada reported seeing something sinister skirting the night sky over the desert, many thinking it was their imagination. In this case, reality turned out to be far more amazing than fantasy. Now that the Air Force has taken the wraps off the stealth fighter, the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing, its host unit, will make its home at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. That means it will no longer be hidden in the desert not far from Las Vegas. Already the airplanes have been used in combat during Operation Just Cause in Panama. And several have deployed to the Middle East as well. At this point, there are still many things about the stealth fighter that are classified. But for now, the public has been introduced to the Nighthawk, the most unusual and awe-inspiring tactical fighter ever built.
It is a shape like no other on Earth. Angular, sinister, sculpted. In some ways, it is art. Art that has form as an integral part of function. This is an aircraft so unique and so capable that it is as much myth as it is reality. This is the SR-71. Marysville, California, a peaceful little hamlet in the northern portion of the Sacramento Valley. Life goes on here much as you would expect it to in any slice of small-town America. But one senses that people here do have an awareness that something special is going on, not too far away. If for no other reason, there is an unmistakable sound that emanates from the valley. races at the mere sight of one. The ultimate in high altitude reconnaissance, the SR-71 is without peer in the world today. Yet few people really know what this airplane is all about, what it's like to fly, and how much of what we hear is myth, and how much is reality. Join us as we go behind the scenes to clear away some of the mysteries surrounding the SR-71. Once a U.S. Army base is now the headquarters of one of the most important units in the Strategic Air Command. Welcome to Beale Air Force Base and the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing. We're flying at three times the speed of sound above 80,000 feet is common practice. In many ways, this is more a space plane than an airplane. As you will see, it operates in that thin layer of atmosphere on the very edge of outer space. For the pilots, there is nothing quite like it. Let's learn about this special bird and the special people who fly it. Here's Deputy Wing Commander, Colonel Donald Shriver. In the history of the SR-71, I know of no failures to, to uh, the tasking that's been given from high. And I think that you could talk to anyone all the way up to the uh, various presidents we've had would say that uh, they're extremely pleased with the capability of the SR-71 and what it's done for the nation. It's been, a, it's been an ex excellent airplane. That's because the SR-71 was designed to do some pretty incredible things right from the start. Lockheed's famed Skunk Works, the factory for some of the most sophisticated airplanes ever built, pioneered the rakish-looking design. What emerged was a twin-engine turbojet aircraft with a double delta wing and a long, slim aerodynamic fuselage. The plane is 107 feet long and 55 feet wide. In order to withstand the high heat of high-speed flight, titanium was used extensively for the first time. It first took to the air in 1964, December 22nd to be exact. It was introduced to service in 1966 and was the first airplane that could cruise at Mach 3. As you might imagine, 
the pilots who flew this bullet were pretty awestruck by it. Lieutenant Colonel Dan House. Well, there are many things, I think, that make the SR-71 unique. Uh, one, even though it's been flying for more than 20 years, it's still the highest and fastest flying aircraft in the world. Uh, it was designed uh, to operate at a, in a very hostile environment, Mach 3 and 80,000 feet. Uh, we go up there and we stay up there for quite a, quite a period of time. There are other airplanes that have gone that high or perhaps that fast, but only for, uh, for a few minutes max. We operate there, that's where the airplane wants to be. But notice there are two crew members, a pilot and the backseater called an RSO, or Reconnaissance Systems Operator. When you're traveling at those speeds, it takes the efforts of two people to get in, get the information, and get out safely. Here's RSO Major Blair Bozak. The uh, colloquialism for the RSO is the spy in the back seat, but in fact we wear a lot of different hats. Uh, we are always there as a co-pilot uh, to the pilot. We don't actually have flight controls, but as far as uh, managing the cockpit and helping the pilot with what he's doing with the jet and where he's taking it, uh, co-pilot duties there in particular, navigator duties of course. We run the defensive systems on the aircraft and also the com uh, communications and the, uh, the sensors, which is why we're going with the aircraft in a certain part of the world in the first place. In order to join Lieutenant Colonel House and Major Bozek among the select crew members of the SR-71, you have to show you can handle this airplane first. This is the training SR-71. Notice the extra cockpit fairing. In order to even be allowed to fly in this airplane, you have to be, well, not perfect, but almost. SR-71 crewmen must have a minimum of 2,500 hours, be a volunteer, and undergo the extreme scrutiny of security checks, medical exams, and professional performance reviews. The air crew that we have always had uh, in the program are hand-picked. They are all volunteers, and interestingly enough, they are basically picked by the other members of the squadron. The guys that are doing the job are probably the most uh, competent to decide who should be helping them do the job and we have a unique organization in that we have a very, very large voice in who comes to go work for us. In addition, the, uh, the folks that designed it, built it, uh, and maintain it, and allow us to do our mission are all very highly motivated, uh, working to the exact same goal, and very well trained. The picture of every SR-71 crew member adorns the walls at Beale. It is a select fraternity. Behind me on this board is a uh, chronological order of crews from day one through the present time. The total pictures behind me of the, all the SR crews for the last 20 some years still is fewer in number than the current NASA astronaut corps. plane uh, is basically a huge fuel tank with some uh, a few little places for sensors and two big engines. Uh, the real magic, I, I would say, and the most radical part of the, uh, of the whole design is the inlet configuration. Now, without the variable geometry on the inlet, we'd be able to go perhaps half as fast as we do right now. Some very smart people a long time ago, late 50s, early 60s, uh, dedicated teams of engineers using slide rules and uh, a lot of pencils and papers and uh, erasers, I'm sure, figured out the design of those inlets to allow this airplane to go Mach 3. And now, it's time a unique spectacle of flight that few will see and only a handful will ever experience.
Once the SR-71 is airborne, the mission begins to unfold. And that can mean going anywhere in the world to have a look with cameras and other surveillance devices. Only 30 of these planes were built, and as a result, it is a rare sight to actually see an SR-71 in flight. One of the few times that can be accomplished is when the airplane slows down long enough to take on fuel. Then you can really appreciate what a beautiful sight the SR-71 is, slipping through the morning sky. While it looks routine, this is a ticklish process. The SR-71 is going just about as slow as it can, and the tanker is moving about as fast as it can. And there are other problems. The speed differential between the SR-71 and the KC-135Qs that we normally refuel off of, as we get towards our maximum gross weight, towards full fuel tanks, we are at, or very near, our minimum allowable uh, airspeed while conversely the KC-135 is pushing his maximum allowable airspeed. Their uh, throttles to the firewall, nose down, shaking, uh, shaking quite a bit, and we're just wallowing around behind them. It's, uh, it can be very tricky sometimes. It's not unusual for the two to remain linked for 20 minutes or more. Remember, this is basically a big gas tank with wings. Raven 1, 200, 230, and uh, Raven 1's a single ship, and uh, vector heading 180. Raven 1, Roger. But soon the SR-71 is free, free to do what it does better than any other airplane in the world. Speed, blistering speed that enables it to survey more than 100,000 miles of airspace in less than an hour. As you might imagine, this sort of performance broke many a record. The most famous, perhaps, was a flight from New York to London in a staggering one hour and 54 minutes. The Blackbirds have set more than seven speed and altitude records, and one gets the feeling more would fall if some of the airplane's highly classified missions were ever made public. And yet it remains a very flyable airplane. From a pure pilotage uh, standpoint, I'd say the airplane is fairly easy to fly, although you have to temper that with the fact that I've been doing nothing but flying Air Force uh, airplanes for the last 16 or 17 years. Uh, the airplane is fairly docile, uh, low speed and low altitude, all the con although the controls are fairly heavy. And once you get the thing uh, supersonic, uh, climbing uh, up to our operating speeds and altitudes, then it handles very, very well.
Say hello to the newest version of the Harrier family, the two-seat TAV-8B Harrier, soon to be delivered to the Marines at Cherry Point. Of all the airplanes in the inventory of the free world, the Harrier stands alone, literally. It is unique in looks, performance, and mission capability. The design first flew back in 1960 as a prototype built by the British firm Hawker Siddeley. Partially from lessons learned in the Vietnam War, the Marine Corps got interested and acquired some of the early model Harriers. Pilots like Captain Rob Ng had to learn to fly a whole new class of fighter plane. Learning the difference between uh, conventional flight and the transition phase into V-style, or vertical and short takeoff and landing, that transition there is probably the most difficult thing to learn. But it's like anything else. It's like learning to walk. Once you learn how, it's easy. This kind of performance is made possible by the remarkable Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine, which puts out 21,000 pounds of thrust. The B model began flight tests in 1981. And while it may look similar to older Harriers, there are big differences, including the wing, several lift improvement devices, and totally updated avionics. Once underway, the Harrier is as quick as any other attack plane. Acceleration-wise, if you take a look at the airplane, you'll see that it's an engine and wing and, and not much else. Acceleration, either from the deck or acceleration from the hover, is uh, unbeatable. There's nothing accelerates from the stop as quick as the AV-8. It's just put the power up, your head goes back whether you like it or not. It's, it's going to go back. What makes the Harrier so important to the Marine Corps is its ability to remain close to the front lines. After all, close air support is what the mission is all about. First to fight, uh, always ready, first ones in, land the landing force. Well, that is true. That's what the Marine Corps is designed for, is to be ready to go any place at any time. Well, there's a, there can be a conflict going on, but there may not necessarily be a runway. I know the Russians can target every airport in Europe but they can't target every thousand foot section of roads. And the Harrier can launch with full internal fuel of 7,500 pounds and nearly 10,000 pounds of external stores. While the vertical takeoff mode is certainly the most mind-boggling aspect of the Harrier performance, a more often used method of getting airborne is the short takeoff roll. The AV-8B can also be found at the Marine's second home, at sea, where, again, the short takeoff and landing mode is the preferred method of getting airborne. Marine Harriers have just completed a successful deployment to the Aleutian Islands, proving the AV-8B sea legs are in pretty good shape. But the undisputed leaders in putting Harriers out to sea are the British. It's called the Sea Harrier, a multi-role fighter and strike airplane. The British have moved away from the conventional format of landing and launching aircraft with steam catapults and arresting gear, and the Harrier at sea is proving to be quite successful. Vertical takeoff allows the Sea Harrier to react instantly to an enemy threat. There is no concern about things like wind over the deck. Rapid launches are possible using 50% of maximum payload. But like the Marines, the British also use the short takeoff, which allows for even higher payloads. In 15 seconds, you're airborne with full war load from a 500-foot flight deck. Not bad.
These proven flight characteristics are enhanced by Britain's latest aviation development, ski jump. This allows slower takeoff speeds, easier handling, and payload can be doubled. Most often, vertical landing is used for recovery. Approach can be made from any direction, so the ship is free to move in any direction, a tactical advantage. The Sea Harrier is armed with a full range of weapons, including 30 millimeter cannons and air-to-air -air missiles like Sidewinder. It can also use the Sea Eagle standoff anti-ship missile, which is as dangerous as the often touted Exocet. Sea Harrier performance was tested in the 1982 Falkland conflict. In all, the British forces lost six Sea Harriers and four RAF Harriers. Argentine total losses stand at 100 aircraft. Although not all of those were due to the air-to-air -air action with Sea Harriers, the aircraft did prove their worth and will be a vital part of Britain's defense posture for many years to come. No doubt the same applies for the Marines and their AV-8Bs. Right now, budgetary constraints may limit the number of Harriers, but the mission is clear, and the pilots are more than happy with the Harrier's ability to accomplish the task. We're not the top dog in the Marine Corps. The Navy, the fighter pilots are the top dog, and the Air Force, the fighter pilots are the top dog. I'm a Marine uh, attack pilot. I'm a support asset for Marines on the ground, and uh, proud of it. The sun rises over the Arizona desert, shimmering above the A-10s of the 355th Tactical Fighter Training Wing. Most Air Force pilots who fly this airplane come here first, and there is no other plane like it. was initially called the Thunderbolt II, in honor of another great Thunderbolt from Republic that was famous for the punishment it could dish out as well as take. But the A-10 was soon affectionately dubbed the Warthog. Not the prettiest airplane in the world, but certainly one of the best close air support aircraft ever built. This is Davis Monthan Air Force Base, an airfield steeped in the history of aviation. First dedicated in 1927 by Charles Lindbergh, the first military pilot to land here was Jimmy Doolittle. And today the tradition continues. This is the center of the known world when it comes to A 10s. 
and to learn to fly it effectively, you start right here. What sort of things would uh, determine whether or not you landed? You said you'd look out and see if you're in a position to land. What would cause you not to land? Well, when I initially do the bull face and bring the power up there and uh, go around, I'm going to be in a leveling off kind of mode and I'm going to be getting a lot closer and a lot steeper, so I may be in a position where I have to push over land. I wouldn't want to do that. Okay. But if I was far enough out on final that I could recapture the glide slope, then I would uh, go ahead and put it on the ground. Good. That's real good. Training an A-10 pilot takes hours and hours of instruction and a dedicated corps of instructor pilots. Men like Major Kevin Barley, himself an A-10 pilot for six years with over 2,100 hours in the airplane. And that nose will have to drop to about 27, 28 degrees nose low before the wingtip is on the horizon, you know, 60 degrees of bank. Okay. There are over 120 hours of classroom instruction and lots of simulator time as well. In all, students will spend at least 10 hours in the confines of the sim. The only reason that there's a 355th tactical training wing is to train A-10 pilots. They leave here and go worldwide to the A-10 units across the world. We are here to train A-10 pilots. Any student will tell you an awful lot can be done to duplicate the experience of flying the airplane especially when an instructor pilot is watching your every move and helping program the situation from a nearby console. Tire Tucson approach, how do you read? Tucson approach, loud and clear, passing 3.5 or 7. Requested vectors, PAR, full stop. Roger, copy that. Iron radar contact, turn right now. Heading of 120, this will be vectors for the PAR runway 30, Davis Moffin approach. Iron turn right, now heading of 303. Coming up from the to the glide path from below. As you can see, the electronics can make a night landing look about as close to the real thing as one can get. Three miles touchdown, on glide path, on course. The relationship between the instructor pilots and the students is a key element in the process. The Air Force already has lots of money invested in the prospective A-10 pilot, and every effort is made to see that he is successful. Lieutenant Jacques Pouchet will soon be posted to an operational squadron in England. The many hours spent with instructors like Major Barley have given him a good deal of confidence. Well, the, the hardest part is that the first time you're in the jet, you're by yourself. So there's nobody there to fall back on. You've got a lot of things that you've got to learn right off the bat because they can't fly you until you've learned all there is to know about the airplane, all the airplane systems, how it handles, how it flies, and that kind of thing. And then the first time, you're in there by yourself. And you just have to fall back on what you've learned in that first couple of weeks. We'll learn more about the training in a moment. But first, let's find out about the A-10. The story of the A-10 really began here in the skies over Vietnam. Aircraft like the F-4 Phantom did an admirable job, but it was not the best close air support airplane. It was never designed to be. Neither for that matter was the F-105 Thunder Chief. In fact, most of the airplanes used in Vietnam were not initially designed for that job. There were limitations in either loiter time, payload, speed over the target, or accuracy. The A-10 is the first airplane designed from the ground up for CAS. From the beginning, the A-10 was designed as a ground support airplane. It's not a perfect airplane, but it's real good at that job. So it, uh, as we were talking before, has a lot of weapons carrying capabilities, a lot of loiter capabilities, uh, very easy uh, to maintain. Uh, you can get in and out of uh, small strips. A uh, lot of design characteristics uh, that are desirable for all airplanes came to the A-10, I think largely because of the lessons learned in Vietnam. The Warthog was designed to cope with the problem quite well. Start with the twin TF-34 GE-100 engines. Each are mounted high on the fuselage to minimize the danger of foreign object ingestion. And their separation helps keep a hit on one engine from being a hit on both. Also, very little of the fuel is carried in the wings so a hit will not cause a fire there. The flight controls are triple redundant, and there are two sets of primary hydraulic controls. All of the construction is rugged, 
built around triple spars. And the pilots sit on a so-called bathtub of armor that surrounds the cockpit. It can withstand a direct hit from a 37 millimeter shell. In short, the warthog can lose a tail, an engine, and two thirds of a wing and still fly. The pilots who have to take it in close appreciate all the extras. All those things are nice, uh, but they are almost the last step defense. What you want to do is not be seen. And then if you're seen, uh, been, be unable to be hit. And then if you're hit, of course, the survivability features are what's going to help you bring it back. The key to the A-10's power projection is the 30 millimeter seven barrel Gatling type GAU Avenger gun. There is nothing a tank fears more. No problem at all with the uh, gun doing a lot of damage to whatever it hits, um, including armor, and uh, very deadly, very lethal, very accurate. Now that we know all the background on this remarkable airplane, let's go flying and see it in action. The Warthog's students settle into the task of learning to turn an airplane into a weapon. For starters, that might involve getting enough fuel to reach the target. Learning to hit the tanker with the A-10 is a big part of the training. And there's more. Initially, uh, we'll go to some areas and practice air work, aerobatics, formation flying, um, simulated emergency patterns, instrument work. That's the first initial month, maybe, of the program. The object is to make flying the airplane second nature, because only then will a student learn to fight with it as well. And as you've heard, the instructor has to teach while flying in another airplane. You can tell a lot from the way the airplane is handling. Uh, you can tell a lot of even the student process, what his thought process is, while not even being in the same airplane. Soon comes the time to employ the airplane's most formidable weapon, the Avenger cannon is mounted right on the airplane's center line so that its recoil won't affect the flight attitude. It's quite a sight to see it in action. The gun can fire at a rate of either 2100 or 4200 rounds per minute. Each shell is the size of a small milk bottle and has a tremendous amount of kinetic energy. The warthog can literally tear a target to pieces. Jacques Boucher remembers the first time he pulled the trigger. You hear a lot how much it shakes the jet and you, the smoke blows by you and you get the smell of the gun gas. But the first time I fired it, I was concentrating so much on the target and hitting the target that I'd pulled off and was on downwind coming back for another pass when I really realized that that was the first time I fired the gun. Obviously, an enemy equipped with surface-to-air missiles or any other kind of weapon is going to try to put a stop to any attack. But the A-10 has engines which run at a reduced heat signature, and the location of the elevator helps to mask whatever heat source there is. Also, the A-10 is painted with a radar and heat dissipating finish, and those dull national markings are part of a low-vis package as well. It's all needed because it's dangerous down low. I think in a high threat environment, low altitude, lots of radios, lots of threats, uh, lots of uh, timely decisions to be made, no one in the airplane except you, uh, that's going to be as demanding a mission as you can get.
course, the A-10 was not designed to fight other aircraft. At a top speed of only 450 knots, one might tend to worry about self-protection. But the A-10 can turn on a dime, which means any attacker could at some point come face to face with one of the most deadly cannons in the world. That's enough to make any wolf think twice about trying to pounce on this warthog. Most of the A-10 pilots that I know do not consider interceptors a threat in a high threat war. If we're ingressing low altitude, egressing low altitude, I don't think that many people expect a lot of losses to occur in the A-10 community because of interceptors. I think most of them occur because of ground fire, surface to air missiles. That'll be the real threat. Uh, if we're at a higher altitude ingressing and egressing, uh, then I think uh, we'll have more to worry about with the interceptors. But just to make sure, air-to-air -air training against dissimilar aircraft is part of the syllabus as well. Back from another mission. One of 37 training flights the student will take in order to leave davis monthan with a chance to make it with a line squadron. With another mission in the bag, the Warthog will soon be cooling its gun along with the Arizona desert. But the next sunrise will bring new missions and new roles to perform. There are still horizons for the A-10. The airplane is already being used in the mission of forward air control. These airplanes will be known as OA-10s and many National Guard units are now flying the airplane as well. The A-10 comes with a lot of things that are designed to help reduce losses. We're going to carry an ECM pod, uh, a, a jamming pod to help jam their radars. The A-10 carries massive amounts of, of self-protection chaff to help break radar locks. It carries massive amounts of flares used to decoy those infrared missiles. Um, it can maneuver well. It flies very well at low altitude. It employs weapons that are standoff weapons, the gun and the maverick. You can employ those successfully, kill the target, and turn and never overfly the target. The future for the Warthog appears to be secure. In wartime, it can operate from lake beds, unimproved runways, and even highways. Recent additions of the Pave Penny laser pod, inertial navigation system, and the Maverick missile will keep it current into the next century. There is no question that the Thunderbolt II, or Warthog, if you will, is the tip of the spear that will help U.S. ground troops maintain the level of superiority they have enjoyed for years. And the 355th is the breeding ground of the fighter pilot who will accomplish that task.